Hello everyone, it's Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet. So pleased to have so many of you on today for what is going to be a treat. We're very, very fortunate to have Sarah Caney on the line. Um, Sarah is an RCVS specialist in feline medicine, based up in Edinburgh, also runs vet professionals, one of the top feline vets in the country. And she's going to be talking to us today about nursing sick, sick cats, tips for carers, Obviously, this has only been made possible thanks to the very kind sponsorship of Feline Friends, and in particular the Feline Friends Academy, which is really there to educate vets, nurses, but also cat owners into, you know, how they can best look after their pets. Cats are very precious to us, you know, they're a very important part of our lives. And um, it's so good to have a charity like Feline Friends who are, you know, so supportive in improving the welfare of cats through increasing our knowledge of their various conditions. This is the first in a series of monthly webinars that we'll be doing. Uh, the website, you probably all know, feline-friends-academy.com is, is there for you to go and have a look at. And within the next week, this will go on as a recording on the site. So if you miss bits, you want to go back to them, you want to tell your friends about it, you'll be able to um, go and have a look at that so Sarah thank you so much for giving your time up thank you feline friends for, for making this possible to have so many cat owners listening in so Sarah over to you thank you Anthony and thank you all for choosing to listen to this webinar I really hope you're going to find it interesting and informative and I too would like to thank feline friends very much for their generous support of this webinar which has made it possible You've heard a little bit about me already from Anthony and this slide just summarises my CV as it were. Um, I am a feline specialist and I've worked as a feline only vet for more than 20 years which is um, as you'll probably appreciate quite unusual and I have a massive passion for feline medicine uh, whether they are everyday cases, complicated cases, young cats, old cats, anything cats uh, is, is a passion of mine. And several years ago, I set up my business, Vet Professionals, to provide some educational resources for pet owners and also for veterinary professionals. And the pictures, uh, the square pictures on this slide are books that are published by vet professionals available through our website and also Amazon as um, print books or uh, PDFs that, as you can see from the titles, deal with very specific conditions um, in great detail, really providing a resource for the carer to really come to understand um, in the best possible detail how they can provide their cat with, for example, kidney disease with the best quality and length of life as possible. There are also on my website some free to access resources, technical guides and videos, for example, which you can access through the helpful info section of my website. Um, and lastly, um, we do owner research through the website. This is clinical research, so looking at different conditions, um, primarily in cats again, because that's obviously my passion, and learning more about um, the carer experience of uh, diagnosis and management of different conditions. And I would like to thank anyone who has participated in any of our previous or current surveys um, for, for your time. It's very, very much appreciated. And we will be launching in the next couple of weeks a new survey on management of cats with kidney disease, um, particularly related to dietary management. And if this is of interest, um, either keep an eye on our website or feel free to drop me an email and I can let you know when that survey has been launched. So the topic for tonight was, of course, um, nursing of cats, uh, sick cats, when to worry, what to do about your concerns, and what nursing tips can you follow at home that um, hopefully are going to be helpful to your cat. And the first thing I would really like to say here is that if you ever think, oh, I don't know if I should be worried about this or not, I'm not sure I, I don't want to bother my vet because I don't know if I, I really should be picking up the phone, I would always say trust your instinct. Um, rather like a, a parent and their child you know your cats better than anyone else and if you're concerned something is not right and you have worries that perhaps this 
is an emergency, don't hesitate to pick up the phone because your vet practice is never going to mind um, talking to you and advising you on whether or not um, they need to or they think they need to see your cat straight away or whether perhaps an appointment the next day or the next week is more appropriate. So, so don't hesitate if you have worries. Um, trust your instincts. If you see something different about your cat, in my opinion, it is likely to be significant. There are, of course, a number of genuine emergencies which really do need you to contact your vet urgently. And I think for most of these, you will know absolutely that without a shadow of doubt, um, you need to get in touch with your vet straight away. So, for example, if your cat looks like uh, this poor character here, um, had very severe liver problem and, as you can see, is barely conscious, really not responsive at all to us, um, extremely weak, uh, not quite unconscious, but uh, but looking pretty sick. Um, if you see your cat at all like this, then then of course you're not going to hesitate to get in touch with us. Another example of a genuine emergency which we would really advise you to contact us as, as soon as possible um, with would be the cat that is straining but apparently unable to pass any urine. So if you see your cat squatting and straining like this cat is in this photo and in particular if when you look afterwards you can't see any evidence of urine being passed then this is a really important emergency situation. And the reason for that is that the most common scenario for, for this particular situation is what's often called a blocked cat, where there is a, a problem with urine um, not being able to pass from the bladder to the outside because of some sort of blockage, physical or functional blockage in the urethra, which is the tube that takes the urine from the bladder to outside. And it is a, a really important emergency because if your cat can't pass urine, they can't excrete the waste products that are in the urine, it can make them extremely ill and actually can kill them within 48 hours. So this really is an example of a situation where don't wait till the next morning, pick up the phone and contact your vet. Sometimes if a cat is straining, it can be difficult to tell whether they're straining to pass urine or feces. And if in any doubt, then again, I would say contact your vets because when we examine your cat, we can very easily determine whether your cat is constipated. So straining to pass feces, which is not so much of an emergency, although of course it very much needs to be treated. Um, uh, or alternatively, where, whether there is this blocked situation where the bladder will typically feel large and very sore and the poor cat is in, in a much more serious state. Difficulty breathing would be another important emergency to be aware of as a carer. And uh, you will know that you very, very rarely, if ever, will see your cat breathing with their mouth open, as is the case in both of the cats shown in this picture. Sometimes in a healthy cat, they will breathe with their mouth open for a very short period if they're stressed. So um, you may have seen your cat when you take it to the vet practice, perhaps for, for a booster vaccination that perhaps associated with the stress of the car journey, the waiting room, the veterinary examination, the cat may start to breathe with their mouth, mouth open, but the, that settles down very quickly. And if that's the case, it probably is just that your cat is quite stressed by the experience, which is, of course, not pleasant, but not uh, the other option, which is the emergency scenario where your cat actually genuinely has difficulty breathing. And if your cat at home starts breathing through the mouth, it indicates in general very, very severe. Often heart failure would be uh, one important cause, but also lung disease and, and other diseases in the chest which affect the breathing. If your cat's not breathing with their mouth open, um, so not quite as dramatic as these photos, but you notice that their breathing is either very noisy or very laboured or very rapid, then that too also can be an emergency. And for those cats, you may find that when you take your cat to the vet, the added stress means that they do start breathing with their mouth open as well. If in doubt, of course, contact your vet. If your cat is vomiting really very frequently and unable to keep fluids down at all, um, then that would be another important emergency. Of course, worrying about dehydration and problems with blood salt levels as a result of being sick. 
Diarrhea doesn't tend to be quite as much of an emergency. It less often causes dehydration in cats, um, but if it is very liquidy, and in particular if your cat is, is fragile in other ways, perhaps either very young or very elderly, or perhaps has other health problems, then that severe diarrhea also could be uh, much more serious a problem. So again, if in doubt, have a chat with your vets. Pain in cats can be difficult to recognise, but again, if, you, if your instinct is telling you that there is something very wrong with your cat, this might be another possibility. And the cat in the lower picture here had a condition called pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas, which can be extremely painful. And this poor cat um, was... Uh, completely conscious so um, aware of everything but in such severe pain that he was really just lying very still um, and when we approached him he would he would often growl and really be very tense until we were able to get his pain painkillers on board and working um, to help uh, control that pain so if you see your cat seemingly very sore very uncomfortable um, the picture on the right hand side shows a different patient but you can see just that very sad sore cat expression um, then again um, painkillers are available and very effective in cats and can obviously have a, a very big impact on this sort of situation. Cats don't commonly have seizures or fits um, but these do happen from time to time and this is another example of a, a serious um, an emergency situation particularly if the seizure goes on for a long time by which I mean more, more than a couple of minutes. A cat that has a, a full complete seizure, a generalised seizure will be unconscious and typically um, have paddling movements of the front and back legs uh, similar to, to a person having any sort of seizure. And important things to, to do in this scenario would include firstly to not stimulate your cat in any way because any sort of stimulation, for example, stroking your cat or talking to your cat actually tends to prolong the seizure. So if you can turn off anything that's making noise like the radio, television, turn off the lights, um, be very calm and quiet, um, the seizure will tend to, to come to an end more quickly. If you're worried that the cat may hurt themselves, for example, they're, they're on a chair and you're worried they're going to fall off, then you can gently lift them down and put them onto the floor. You don't need to worry about cats swallowing their tongues. You don't need to put your, put your hands in their mouth or anything like that. Just stand back um, and observe them. And if you can, if, it's, if you remember at the time to actually take any video footage of the seizure, that can be helpful because not all seizures are generalised and it can be useful as a vet to have um, detailed information about exactly what is happening to the cat while they're going through this fit. Um, and also, if you can time how long the seizure lasts, um, then that can be helpful as well to us. If your cat's diabetic and receiving insulin therapy for their diabetes, then you will probably have been told um, that one possibility is that blood sugar levels can go too low as a, as a consequence of insulin, particularly if the diabetes is temporary and the cat's, uh, the cat's condition is recovering. So if your cat is diabetic and it has any sort of a fit, um, it's, uh, it can be useful to have some glucose powder available or failing that, even honey or jam in the house and put some of this on the cat's gums if you can um, without uh, risking harm to yourself where that sugar can be absorbed and help to correct that low blood sugar level. Still contact your vet and still they will almost always are going to say bring your cat in so we can check blood glucose levels and, and make sure that they're stable thereafter but all these little emergency tips can certainly help. If your cat has any sort of bleeding issue, this cat you can see has got a terrible nosebleed which has resulted in blood dripping and splattering everywhere. For this cat and this condition, um, not so much an emergency from a blood loss perspective, just a, a dramatic photo and actually this cat had a polyp in the nose, so quite a benign disease that had a dramatic consequence but we were able um, to treat the disease and, and help this cat. Um, if your cat is bleeding because of a wound then as with a person applying some pressure with a clean bandage um, whilst you then also arrange to take your cat into the vet clinic um, can of course help to, um, to, to minimise further blood loss and, and help to stabilise the problem. 
if your cat is hit by a car, so has a, a road traffic accident, um, then the possibilities really uh, in terms of outcome vary enormously. As you will know, some cats can be very, very lucky and, and emerge more or less unscathed. Other cats like this poor cat um, can have more serious injuries. But I would encourage you, however minor things appear to be superficially, so even if your cat seems to be okay, I would still very much encourage you to have them checked out as soon as possible because some injuries can be initially quite hidden, quite difficult to spot, um, but very much benefit from being diagnosed and treated promptly. For example, uh, damage to the bladder, damage to the diaphragm, which, which can cause big problems later on, um, but which if stabilised often can be treated very, very successfully. So any of these situations, and there, there are uh, others that um, I, I've not included here, but any situation where you really feel you're, you're con severely concerned about your cat, don't hesitate to get in touch. And I think have a, a, a shorter um, tolerance, if you like, a, a, a shorter time to press, the, press that panic button if your cat is very young or very old or if they have other health issues, because as with people in this same scenario, um, they are going to be more vulnerable and can potentially deteriorate more quickly. So getting them to the clinic for treatment as soon as possible um, can definitely be a big advantage there. When it comes to transporting your cat to the vet practice, um, vets in general are very keen on baskets like this, a top loading basket. Um, and the reason for this is, is that whilst they, they're quite plain and certainly don't look very glamorous from the cat's perspective, it's extremely easy to get an injured cat in and out of the basket without any sort of fight or, or stress or hassle. So if you can choose a basket which is either like this or very easy to attach you can remove the, the top half of the basket easily that makes a massive difference to being able to put in an injured cat um, that you don't really want to be um, moving around too much for instance if there are any broken bones there um, but also getting the cat out of, of that basket again at the clinic should be as as easy as possible Cats tend to feel um, less stressed if they are in a dark, calm place. So when it comes to the, the transport, particularly if you feel the cat is a bit distressed by their condition, if you cover that basket with a towel or a blanket so that the cat is in the dark, secure that basket in your car with a, with a seat belt uh, or put the basket in a footwell and just drive as, as calmly uh, and quietly as you can to the clinic. So perhaps, you know, don't have, have your radio on for that journey so that it is um, as, as calm and, and quiet a journey as possible for the cat. I'm going to finish off by talking about some nursing tips for sick cats at home um, because this often is something that, that we need to be involved with as carers and there are many illnesses which can be very effectively managed at home but I think it is really useful for you to know the range of things that you can have an impact on and how you can help um, your cat to, to recover as soon as possible. One thing that is really important to know as a carer is that cats are very vulnerable to really um, serious side effects if they lose their appetite. And in fact, if a cat doesn't eat for three or more days, that can actually be extremely dangerous and potentially life-threatening. Um, a, a sustained loss of appetite can actually result in death of the cat, um, particularly due to fatty changes in, in the liver that can lead to a condition called hepatic lipidosis. And that has a very, very high death rate, unfortunately. So so don't ignore it in your cat. And again, if not sure whether or not you, you should be worried or how worried you, you should be, then talk to your vet. In the short term, loss of appetite also still does have a number of serious consequences. So I've listed some of them here. Dehydration. Cats aren't very good at drinking and they often will get a lot of their fluids um, through their food. So if they're not eating, um, they also are, are immediately vulnerable to dehydration. Also, uh, a lot of blood salts um, that uh, perform vital functions like potassium, um, cats are very dependent on getting through their diet. So if your cat stops eating often, its blood potassium levels will start to fall. And that actually often makes the cat feel unwell. And you can then end up with this vicious cycle of a weak, lethargic cat not wanting to eat, um, partly because of its low potassium levels. 
blood sugar levels can fall muscle and fat start to be used as energy sources and once muscle has been lost unfortunately it's very very difficult to return that muscle function so we definitely want to halt that in its tracks where at all possible and as you can see on the right side also a number of other consequences that affect our cat's ability to fight whatever illness they have so reduced immune function means they're more vulnerable to infections and more vulnerable to a slower recovery also more vulnerable to problems with with metabolizing breaking down drugs and medications that we give them um, anemia a, a lack of red blood cells because of of the illness they're suffering from and overall um, this can um, really reduce their quality of life but of course if prolonged can actually potentially be life-threatening so so don't ignore um, poor appetite in your cat in general for feeding so this relates to healthy cats as well as those that are unwell cats prefer their food bowl to be separated from their water bowl so if you have a double feeder with food one side water the other side bear in mind that's probably not the way your cat would prefer to eat and drink they rather would have those two things a little bit separated and they tend to prefer ceramic or glass or metal food and water bowls. In other words, uh, less keen on plastic, which can affect the, the flavor of the food and the water. And in general, they also don't like their whiskers touching the side of dishes. So a, a flat dish like a saucer would probably be preferred by a cat um, rather than a, a deep bowl, which they have to put their head into um, to eat food on the bottom. As with us, a nice calm and quiet location where they're not going to be disturbed is always going to be more popular. And for elderly cats in particular, um, especially those that are suffering from arthritis that can affect the back and the legs, um, then raising the food bowl, as shown in this picture on the right hand side, can really make eating um, much more comfortable for the cat. So if you think your elderly cat may have arthritis, um, try this out at home. Just raise the food bowl. It doesn't have to be quite as, as smart an option as shown here you can just use an upturned ice cream tub for example to put your saucer on and you may find your cat prefers to eat uh, at a higher level if your cat is not eating it's suffering from a poor appetite then offering a mixture of foods can be helpful to give them a choice and of course things that are, are smellier and more palatable um, tend to have a better chance of being eaten if your cat has flu, like this poor character here that you can see has, has sore eyes and a bit of a discharge from the nose, then wiping discharges away, helping the cat's uh, own ability to smell can be helpful, um, as well as warming the food and offering very smelly foods like, for example, pilchards or sardines, which if your cat's a fish lover, uh, may tempt them back into eating. I've put avoid the buffet option. Uh, what this means is really resisting the temptation um, to open every single option of cat food at home and in your local supermarket and, and offering all of these simultaneously to your cat. If your cat's feeling unwell and you offer it a huge range of different foods, it can be overwhelming and actually counterproductive. So ideally offer one thing at a time. And if your cat shows no interest after half an hour, 45 minutes, take it away. Warming the food slightly does help because cats are then their natural instinct is of course to eat prey species like little mice um, and they eat them just after they've killed them so they are uh, just below body temperature and other things that can help to encourage eating would be sitting with your cat and uh, offering food by hand stroking your cat grooming your cat um, and perhaps putting just a little bit of food on onto either the paw or next to the mouth to stimulate a little bit of an eating response in the hope that once the cat's tasted some food they may think yes actually i i quite I would in general um, say you, you should not try syringing food into your cat as a way of supporting them nutritionally because most cats really, really hate this. And again, that can be counterproductive. And also giving food by a syringe, um, it can sometimes go down the wrong way. In other words, be inhaled into the chest and cause a pneumonia. So um, unless you feel very strongly that your cat tolerates being syringed food very very well and your vet is happy for you to do that i would avoid that because for most cats it it really is the wrong thing to do also avoid um, what i would call stressful events so for example if your cat's on medication try and separate the medication from the feeding time if your cat's not eating very well so that the cat doesn't associate 
nasty medicine with nasty food. Um, and if you have uh, several of you in the household, you can even have the nice person who does all the lovely hand feeding and grooming and cuddling duties, and perhaps the not so nice person that has the job of medicating the cat. And then again, the cat doesn't look at you and think, oh, no, you just, you gave me a pill. I'm not going to eat. I don't like you. Remember to avoid foods that cats can't tolerate. So things with onion or garlic in them are poisonous to cats and can cause anemia, which again can be fatal. So a classic, uh, classic example of things to avoid would be um, baby food um, in the supermarket jars or also if you buy fresh cooked chicken from the supermarket, often it's been basted in onions and garlics. Uh, and whilst the cat may think it's really palatable, unfortunately that onion and garlic can cause severe problems. Also bear in mind that vet practices have a number of convalescent foods available which have been specially formulated for cats with a poor appetite so they may be able to supply you some of these to try at home. Varying the, the texture or consistency of the food can be helpful so mashing the food for cats that have sore mouths or dental problems can be helpful um, and some cats that if they like catnip putting a little sprinkling of catnip on the food can encourage appetite as well. It's always better that cat eats something than nothing. So even if you're trying to encourage the cat to eat a special diet that your vet has recommended, for example, um, it would be always better that the cat eats is something than nothing at all. So if your cat will only eat prawns for three days in a row, um, whilst that's not balanced as a long-term option, it's much better than eating nothing for three days in a row. Encouraging drinking can also be important for some cats, particularly elderly cats, particularly those that are um, vulnerable to dehydration. And actually, this is a topic in one of the guides on my website, in one of our free download guides. Um, so feel free to consult that afterwards. But some of the key points here would again be to consider raising the bowl if you think your cat may have arthritis and may find crouching down to drink uncomfortable using again metal glass or ceramic bowls rather than plastic bowls, separating them from the food bowl, filling the bowl to the brim, um, experimenting also with different um, water containers. So some cats like drinking out of the glass by the side of your bed or out of a jug. Some like running water from a, a tap dripping or a water fountain. And also experiment with the, the type of water you offer. So you might find your cat really doesn't like the tap water in your area. It prefers either mineral water or perhaps collected rainwater. Um, and it can be worth having, it, having a little bit, a bit of an experiment in all of these things. You can also make a, a broth or flavoured water, for example, um, liquidising some uh, cooked prawns in some water. If your cat likes prawns, you can make a sort of prawn broth or you can poach um, some chicken or some fish in a pan of water. And once that water is cooled down, you can offer that to your cat um, as, a, as a tasty drink. So there are all sorts of things that can be tried and, and more information in the free download on my website. Other general things that can improve well-being, well, if your cat's not feeling very well, it often will not pay as much attention to its, its own um, personal hygiene, if you like. So grooming um, really can, can be something that falls by the wayside, and yet cats really dislike feeling unkempt and ungroomed. So if you can help with grooming, um, if you can help by keeping the eyes and the nose clean, your cat really will appreciate that. And, and having somewhere also that the cat can be uh, in a calm and quiet location at home. If you have a busy household and a poorly cat, um, that can be difficult. So if you can maybe make your spare room or, or somewhere that's quiet, the, the cat's special little haven where they can perhaps escape from other animals and other people, um, that also can help to improve well-being and recovery. As I, I hope I've already emphasised, don't hesitate to ask for advice and support from your vet clinic. It's what they're for and, it, and they do want to be consulted. They, they want you to ask them rather than anyone else for any support you might need. If your cat's been prescribed any medication, then don't hesitate to ask for advice on how to give that to your cat. Um, for example, giving a pill is something that you know not many people have experience of um, before they, they have a poorly cat to look after and it can be challenging. 
Also bear in mind if you are giving your cat any pills that if you give them to your cat dry, in other words, uh, if the cat has the, the, the pill separate to um, any food or water, then that pill can sit in the cat's throat in the same way that it does with ourselves if we ever take a pill without any food or water. But putting a blob of butter on the cat's nose, which is the, the left hand picture here, or syringing a little bit of water um, are good ways of getting the pill to go down um, if your cat is not eating but you still very much want it to um, to take its medication and for that medication to, to go to the right place. So don't hesitate to ask for advice and support from your vet clinic. There are some other resources that I can recommend to you. Um, my website vetprofessionals.com is one of those and this um, picture on the bottom right hand side is just a screenshot showing that helpful info menu I, I mentioned. So if you look there you, there you can see the free downloads which include the technical guide on how to encourage your cat to drink more but there are also um, other technical guides and some video tutorials um, that are aimed at, at carers um, as well as of course the books. If you have an elderly cat then the the salmon pink uh, book cover to the left is uh, a resource I would really recommend written by myself and Vicky Halls who's a behaviourist and there's a lot of information on nursing elderly cats in this book which might be of interest. When it comes to first aid, the Blue Cross have a really nice leaflet you can download, um, which I have a picture of on the right hand side of the slide. Um, you can access that via their website and they have a lot of information on how to um, provide emergency treatment for a number of scenarios that I've, I've sadly not had time to go into detail. And the Cat Health and iCat Care websites would also be ones that I can recommend for having good quality information available to you. So thank you very much for choosing to listen to this webinar. I hope you have found it helpful and I hope that all your cats are extremely well and not in need of any veterinary attention. Um, but I would be happy to answer questions if you have any. And also if anyone would like a PDF copy of the slides I've used, if there were things that um, you wanted to write down but didn't have time, please feel free to email me either sarah at vetprofessionals.com or info at vetprofessionals.com. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was fantastic. I think, you know, really practical. It's, it's little things that even as vets we can forget. And we can sometimes forget, you know, difficulties that owners have. I've just uh, seen my next door neighbour's cat who, who we, we sort of sent off to the vets. As you know, I'm not practising now. And, um, you know, it's got hyperthyroidism. Tablets are difficult, but there's now a liquid form. And, you know, by chatting to the client, it was easy then to make sure my neighbor that she got a medication that she wasn't going to get stressed out about. So, as you said, the vets are there to really help and assist and make, you know, your life easy. It's obviously a stressful time when a, a you know, a, a member of the family, the, the, the pussycat is unwell. So, you know, do go and um, seek advice, you know, from your vets about that. Would you agree with that, Sarah? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think often um, you know pe people um, quite rightly don't know that there are other options available, like you're saying with the liquid medication versus tablet. Um, it's the same for specialist diets. So if you're struggling with with uh, um, succeeding with whatever you've first been provided, then definitely communicate that to your vets because almost always there are alternatives. I've just um, wanted to again, and, and perhaps Luke, you can put in the chat box. So I know people are putting questions into the chat box, which is great. Um, Luke will put in the um, the website. So do go over and have a little nose at the website. If you go right to the bottom, you'll find that uh, we've got various webinars coming up over the next few months, uh, which you know should be excellent. Uh, there, there is uh, a tab at the top called webinars click on there you can register for webinars if you've got any questions any comments that you want to leave uh, then just use the contact form and obviously we can uh, we can get back to you i think you have to leave your email address <clears throat> but we'll be able to get back to you on those we have a few questions and i think you did say you were happy to answer these sarah i yes, think absolutely yes Again, I'm probably going to be a little bit boring and say, you know, it's difficult for Sarah to answer specific questions because obviously she won't have examined the cat and so on. But 
happy to give sort of general advice if that's uh, okay for people. So let's see what we've got. Um, so let me see. I've seen cat bags for transporting cats. What do you think about these? Are these better than a box? So it depends a little bit what, what you mean by a cat bag. I mean, I, 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 I'll answer the in two ways <laughs> because there are very soft cat carriers which are a bit like a bag and often a mesh format and you and you sometimes will see people almost using them uh, like a shoulder bag you know uh, and it looks a little bit more comfortable and easy to carry the cat than often an inflexible basket um, so I would I, I certainly wouldn't have any problem with that um, I think in some countries you might need to be careful about uh, overheating with some basket types um, so if you are in a hot country definitely I would sort of pay attention to that um, living in Scotland that's rarely an issue we struggle with I'm afraid um, then there is another sort of cat bag which just in case you're asking about this which uh, often uh, well not often actually occasionally is used for um, restraint for cats um, and this is more something that is likely to be used in a clinic but they are they tend to be called cat bags which is why I was mentioning them and for cats that are uh, shall we say less happy for procedures can sometimes be helpful for example you you can more or less zip a cat, cat up in one of these bags so that their head is out and they obviously can breathe without any difficulty and perhaps one leg can be uh available through another zipped opening in the bag um, but if the cat is for ex example struggling or fighting with other legs that they are contained within this bag and I haven't really had a great deal of experience of using those myself I've tended to to use a more traditional towel uh, as needed um, but my understanding is these can be helpful in some situations but also there are always some cats that are can be unhappy with certain procedures and if your cat is really unhappy in a cat bag then of course you should not use that you should find an alternative way of of dealing with the situation which might for some cats be to sedate it so i hope through that both those maybe i've answered the question you were thinking of that's great um nicola has asked um i have a cat whose jaw and skull was damaged in a road traffic accident last year he had a feeding tube for a few months while he recovered and since having that removed will only eat liquid food despite his injuries now mostly being healed and there's there being no apparently additional pain do you have any tips on how i can get him back onto solid food yeah so well firstly um you know very sorry to hear about you know the tough time that you've all had and um uh, but also well done to, to you for obviously um pursuing quite a difficult path in terms of tube feeding your cats through that recovery period um, sometimes cats will if they particularly if they have a bad association with either eating or a certain food it, it can have quite lasting consequences um, so I, I think the this may well not be a permanent issue but uh, but it may it may be quite a long-lasting issue and my general tips would really be to try and give the cat the choice uh, without uh, any sort of pressure or of course no punishment for selecting a liquid option um, the main downside of the liquid i'm going to assume is either if it's a specialist diet the expense uh, or if if you're liquidizing a standard diet just the sheer hassle of, of having to go through that obviously from the cat's health perspective as long as the diet is balanced there's not you know it's not a particular issue with it having a liquidy diet and at least you would know um, if you're if your cat is an older cat they're much less likely to be vulnerable to dehydration but from a practical perspective i would say really just to be quite low-key but keep trying you know a little bit of this a little bit of that um and uh, and hope that your cat will with time take the initiative to explore and perhaps use some toys and things in the house put some of these puzzle feeders to interact a little bit um that might um stimulate some feeding activity if you look up puzzle feeders or, or similar you'll you'll see there are a range of of options and if your cat is quite playful that might be a way of encouraging them to try um the the, the hard food again Thank you, Sarah. Just again, um, while I'm thinking about it, um, two things, if you want to put in where you're listening in from, it's just been interesting seeing somebody listening in from Dublin, 
which is great. Uh, just again, thank you so much to Feline Friends for making this webinar possible to get uh, Sarah over to, to speak to us. And Sarah, as I sometimes say, you never know with a webinar how well you've done because there's no tumultuous applause at the end. But just to, you know, steady your nerves, so to speak, we've got Sarah, and it wasn't you, wasn't you obviously, saying thank you for a helpful <laughs> session. So you weren't self-promoting there. Uh, uh, Ada saying thank you for a very helpful lecture, listening in from Dublin. Um, excellent from Lauren, thank you. Francesca, wonderful. She found it very interesting. And Francesca, I know, is from Italy, so hello to Francesca. Um, Barbara, thank you very much. And then Lauren saying she has a question regarding chronic uh, kidney disease. My cat is in stage two and his appetite goes up and down but I'd like some support with his specialist diet. What, what's a, a tip maybe with the specialist diets to get them to eat? Yes, so um, that's it's quite a big topic um, because as you will know, having uh, obviously learned a, a bit about your cat's condition, um, there are there's quite a number of reasons why a cat with kidney disease um, can be more challenging to to get to eat they of course the illness can affect them in a number of ways um, so um, the first thing would be to obviously talk to your vets and and to make sure that they are aware of this because if for example um, when on further assessment they find perhaps your cat has um, some complications of kidney kidney disease an example would be anemia um, if your cat is anemic and feeling weak their, their appetite is likely to be low but there is treatment available for the anemia and so of course treating that and correcting it can have an impact on appetite so I start by looking for all those things that are, are potentially fixable if you do all that and find that still your cat's appetite is a bit variable from day to day um, then um, there firstly uh, there are a number of different kidney diets available um, and uh, a number of different companies that make kidney diets, but each of those also typically will have several in their range. So whilst it can be a bit wasteful on throwing away food, unless you conveniently have a dog in the house that can hoover up anything your cat doesn't like, um, there are an awful lot of different options that you can try. Um, and uh, for example, um, one company, Royal Canin, do this... Um, uh, starter kit for cats with kidney disease which has a, a, a uh, a sample of all of their kidney diets in it. I think it costs about £25. You can get it, I think, online or through your vet clinic. And that can be quite useful because it gives you an opportunity to try in small amounts all of the different things available. Also remember just that it's, again, it's always more important your cat eats something than nothing to keep persisting with that kidney diet though. So if this week your cat's not into it, well, don't forget it forever. Perhaps next week, if your cat's feeling better, offer a little bit of that kidney food, try and encourage them to eat more and more of that. Um, and if uh, in spite of, of all the sort of uh, long-term persistence, again, you feel your cat's appetite just is, is poor in general, bear in mind that there are medications that can help to stimulate appetite. So appetite stimulants in cats, also treatments for, for feeling sick, which some cats uh, with kidney disease do as well. So there's a lot of different things that you can work through and try. Um, and most cats with stage two kidney disease, it is possible to stabilize them. Um, and in fact, you are definitely doing the right thing by trying to feed your stage two cat um, a kidney diet because that very much is proven to improve quality of life and length of life in the long term but as as we've discussed it's it doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to do but you are doing the right thing no absolutely i think there was a study done once sarah uh, I, i'm sure you're aware of it that, that showed it, it can almost double the life expectancy compared with just feeding normal food so it is one of those Definitely. ones that's really proven to work but cats can be cats and not eat it and it, as you say it can be a bit of a challenge can't it yes yes uh, pat saying thank you kinross in scotland very informative yes, as they've just opened oh, a small <laughs> board in cattery so she's looking forward to future webinars and i know uh, luke has put on the site uh, has put in the chat box the 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 website you can just go onto the website and and you know register for the webinars that you find interesting <clears throat> I've just had a tweet actually from one of um, one of my Twitter people saying um, New York City's first dog cafe pairs coffee with canines, and I'm I'm wondering when we're going to get um, 
you know, a feline cafe, but uh, New York have got their first dog cafe anyway, so that should be interesting. The reason I'm saying that is we've got Paula listening in from uh, New York City, and she's saying, if you suspect a protein sensitivity to chicken or turkey, does that generally show up in stool or in vomiting or both or some other way? So dietary uh, intolerances or sensitivities ca can show in either or both. It probably is the short answer. If, you're, if your cat is um, showing any sort of bowel signs at all, then that would be one of the possibilities. And, and in fact, if your cat is showing um, signs of bowel disease, so vomiting, diarrhea, for example, but not in an emergency sort of way, one of the most straightforward things that you can try is actually a dietary trial, which most cats actually are fine with chicken. So chicken is often used as a, as a convalescent food. And in the short term, just feeding your cat chicken for a few days to see if that uh, improves the, the vomiting or diarrhea uh, often can be very successful as well. In the longer term, of course, that's not a balanced diet. So again, you would need to have a chat with your vets about what might be the best option. And of course, with my dermatologist hat on, sometimes with a food allergy, cats might be itching. You might think they're fleas, but actually there's food involved. So that's always another thing to think about mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Um, Jane is saying she's in Worcestershire, sadly lost her cat, Sir Henry, to a tumour in his chest looking for a new friend. So I'm really sorry to hear that, Jane, but hopefully you've enjoyed the, the webinar. Uh, can we watch this webinar afterwards? I missed the beginning, Deanda. Yeah, that should be on the site within the next few days and we will let you know when that comes up. But obviously, you know, come back to the website as well. <clears throat> One of the ladies I just noticed, a bit worried, a cat had a cold over Christmas and she stuck it in a cage and was encouraging it to breathe in hot water, uh, you know, steamed water with perhaps a, a little additive like a ulbus oil. Is something like that likely to cause a problem for a cat? So the steam, I think, is is a good idea. Um, I'd be always a bit careful about things like ulbus oil in, in cats because we just don't know as much about their their sensitivities, and and yeah. uh, it may be fine, but I'd just be a little bit cautious about that, particularly. Uh, again, the very young, the very elderly, those more fragile cats. But the steam itself, I think, is a good idea. So something simple you can do if your cat is very fluey and bunged up is, is sort of run a steamy shower or bath and take the cat into the bathroom with you um, just to try and loosen those secretions and, and uh, make breathing a bit easier. That's great. Jenny's listening in from North London. Linda, thank you very much, is in Cumbria. Listening from Bournemouth, absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, so lots of uh, positive comments. Susan, very useful webinar. Thank you. Jane, it was very good. Thank you. Lauren in Chester, in Cheshire, sorry. Um, my cat is potentially facing surgery, which includes removal of both eardrums, so will be deaf as a result. Have you got any recommendations how I can care for her well-being going forward, please? Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear um, that your cat needs the surgery. Um, however, many cats um, that have this sort of surgery do amazingly well, as uh, I'm sure Anthony with his, again, dermatology will have seen these sort of cases um, as well. <coughs> Um, and um, I think it's try, all about trying to put yourself in your cat's shoes in terms of ongoing management and thinking, well, how would I feel if I was completely deaf? And, and just very simple, sensible things like not uh, giving your cat a shock by you know, coming, coming out from behind it where it can't see you and touching it. So come round from the front so your cat can see you first um, or stamp a bit on the floor so they can feel the vibrations through the floor as you're coming um, because they may not may, may not be able to hear you but many deaf cats do, do extremely well um, you may depending on where you live the other things to really bear in mind would be whether your cat may, may be more vulnerable to road traffic accidents through not being able to hear so um, it's have a think about how that works for you in terms of whether you can find your cat indoors a bit more because again if they're if they're unable to hear and <clears throat> like to lie in the middle of the road um then you know those sorts of hazards can be more of an issue but most cats really adapt and and cope so well that it's, it's hard to to believe that they can't hear afterwards 
Amanda's listening in from Australia, so it must be very early in the morning there, Amanda. So well done. I'm probably a tiny bit hotter than we are in uh, Scotland and in Liverpool, respectively. Um, Sally is saying, any recommendations of how to move a cat in case of an accident to avoid provoking more damage, i.e. in case of a spine injury or another serious injury? I suppose, you know, um, Sally's thinking of a road traffic accident, maybe. Yeah, so I think in that situation, if, if you are able to support the cat as it is um, then that's uh, an advantage so that might uh, might involve very gentle lifting onto something flat um, or if your basket cat basket is quite roomy just very carefully lifting the cat in into there um, but if you had an alternative surface if the cat's relatively immobile um, that might also be an option so even you know taking a a, a, a drawer out of your chest of drawers or whatever to lift the cat into as a as a shallow but flat surface could could work um, there's not obviously we don't tend to have the specialist equipment that's available um, from a human ambulance perspective so we just do things as, as gently and as supportively as we can and obviously keep fingers and toes crossed on the journey that um, everything will be okay i think sometimes with those serious injuries actually the most important thing is to get the cat into the vets as quickly as possible and you know if you're waiting potentially for the vet to come out for all sorts of reasons that might be difficult and it might be just as easy to you know take your coat off cuddle the cat in and, and get into a taxi and, and get up to the vets as quickly as possible isn't it really yeah yeah um jenny i have to i you made me um laugh a little bit and i apologize uh, for for saying this i, I presume you've done a, a typing misspell there because uh, jenny said any advice about how to control overeating by a rescue cat lily eats all her food and then my other twos i have tried our royal cannon's sanity and appetite control with little effect i presume <laughs> that jenny meant satiety and appetite control there but i can understand she's getting a bit insane with uh this cat stealing the other two cats food it, we, we often see that don't we one big fat cat and uh, two slightly skinnier ones yes it's really challenging i mean there are a number of things that you can try which sort of vary in in um you know how sort of how clever and specialized they are really i guess the, the, the sort of bells and whistles that is available uh, nowadays would be to have a microchip controlled food bowl um so that each cat uh, their microchip only will allow them access to one bowl so you very much control what food is available and those are available uh, to buy but they are they are expensive so that may rule them out depending on how many other cats you have to feed um sometimes it's possible to have uh, what, what i would call a, a sort of creep feeding system so if your overeating cat is 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 overweight and and can't jump on jump up onto work surfaces for example mm. providing the other cat's food at, at, at that higher level so where they can get but the the over overweight cat can't get um, that can be an option also um, trying to minimize how much food is just left available ad lib so meal times and being strict which i know is difficult um, and you may find as well if, if you're if your overeating cat is very quick that you need to sort of put the cats into separate rooms with their food and then remove all the food before you open the doors and, and let the cats mix up again um, so there are sort of a number of different scenarios and, and again i would i would chat with your vet clinic about having support for this as well because you're obviously working hard uh, by trying specialist diets and i think you know it's good to have support and monitoring um, available to you as well fantastic sarah thank you so much for all those i've got a last couple we've got molly listening in from minneapolis i mean the world is becoming a smaller place yeah. it's lovely to get all of these people listening in from all over the world you know and and you know getting the good advice which obviously just helps them to care for their treasured member of the family better so uh, thank you so much sarah for for being so generous in your sharing uh, caroline said well done sarah excellent thank you so much for an excellent webinar and uh, molly from minneapolis also said thank you for the information so thank you so much sarah i've really enjoyed it um it sounds like a lot of other people on the call have done so as well and uh, you know do go on to the website it's feline-friends-academy.com and uh, you should be able to see some of the other webinars that are coming up we've got some cracking speakers 
uh, you know, all experts in the field. I know we've got a veterinary dentist coming up shortly as well. So do go and have a look at those and feel free to register. And if you've enjoyed them, tell your friends. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you once again to Feline Friends for making it possible. And we'll see you all next month on another webinar. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye.